Greetings and salutations, everyone. Today we're going to take a look at the democratic process within the United States at the dawn of the 19th and mid 19th century. So let's get started. The idea of having land to vote had been something that dominated American politics prior to the Revolutionary War. Following the war, it was still common, just less practiced. And as the original 13 states started to adopt the new constitution, it started going away one at a time. The hallmark of citizenship in this new nation was the right to vote, not the right to have land. And by 1840, 90% of adult white men can vote. They are involved. They are politically um, part of political party interested. And sometimes they get violent when things go not their way. Rhode Island was one of the last few places that still had property requirements to vote. They said you needed to have land or property that was valued at $134 or a year or rent of $7 a year. Now, this is, of course, in 19th century money, so it's closer to a couple of hundred bucks today, but it's by no means an insurmountable amount of money unless you're working in a factory condition. And for those individuals, you might as well, this this was not something you could easily afford. And when there was a group of people who wanted to see a reform happen to this law, and they a new constitution for the state would be drafted, and this was created by Thomas Dore. He was the lawyer who drafted this new constitution and was ultimately elected governor to enact this. But he was... It's not that he did this and that was wrong. He did this and he his election happened outside of the usual election time. So he's arrested for treason. He's sentenced to two years for treason. But ultimately, what the what Dorr and his followers wanted to do did get done. So it's kind of hard to say that anything big was hindered or accomplished here anyways. Rhode Island would ultimately eliminate those property qualifications for native-born people. If you were a foreign-born person, you still had to have a property if you wanted to vote until 1888. One of the most influential individuals to create the idea to understand really the idea of the United States was this man, Alex de Tocqueville. He was a French writer who toured America. He puts this book together called Democracy in America, and he says that in it, the American culture is unique, it is intuitive, equalitative, egalitarian. You could belong to so many things all at once. And he says that nowhere else in the world could the American experience be recreated. At the dawn of the 19th century, we see this information explosion as more and more newspapers are printing more and more things. What was most popular was the penny press, and this was a type of newspaper, magazine, handout pamphlet, something like that, that sold for a penny. It usually had the basic news, and then it had... But, you know, no one buys it for the basic news. It had these sensational stories in it, the crime stories, the scandal stories, the party stories. And to a lot of these different penny presses, we see that more and more contributors are going to be women who are going to have a here's what you can do inside the home. Here's what you can do to uh, cook, to clean. Here's the domestic side of life. Here's poetry, here's essays, here's, you know, boy, it would sure be nice if women could learn to read and write and, you know, that kind of stuff. And it gets slowly more and more attention. In Europe, the hierarchy of the state really divided the state. You have people who are aristocrats who dress differently than other folks, who ride in carriages differently, who ride in different entire train cars than 
other folks. But in the United States, being a citizen was what it meant. The thing that divided people was not different social classes, it was different race. And racist imagery, racist stereotypes were established definitely by the end of the 18th century and by the dawn of the 19th century african americans are portrayed as well in in very unflattering ways as stupid as dishonest and all these quote unquote scientific justifications were used to prove this the pseudosciences that were created at the dawn of the 19th century people would try to say as real science for the next 140 years by 1860, African Americans could only vote in five New England states, and even in some of those cases, you also had to have property. Less than 4% of the nation's free African American population even could legally vote. For the American public, they viewed African Americans as non-Americans. They viewed them as foreigners in the same way they viewed Indians, Native Americans, as non-Americans. If you were African-American, free or not, you couldn't serve in the military, you couldn't testify in court, generally speaking, you couldn't vote, and attending a public school was also not gonna happen. The War of 1812 really jump-started the American economy and American industry. So much so that the fear was our economy needed another label of protection, needed another layer of control. And Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun propose the idea of a new national bank. This will increase tariffs and will be responsible for funding a lot of the roads and canals that we're going to see built at the dawn of the 19th century. The Second Bank of the United States is chartered in 1860, sets off a tariff option, which is going to protect American goods, but doesn't actually improve American goods. The big thing we see immediately about the Second Bank of the United States is it controls three and a half more times the money of the first one. It was a very controversial institution because you have a private business that's also the government's financial agent. It can issue money and it's also supposed to be able to regulate the supply of paper currency. So it can make whoever is controlling it fantastically wealthy, is answerable both to the people and the private sector. It controls paper and metallic currency like gold or silver, and it can collect taxes. It's, and again, it's a private bank. It's a very interesting thing because at every step of this, it looks like, oh, this is not going to end well. Oh, a little bit of corruption. This thing is going to fall apart. And in essence, this does lead to the panic of 1819, which was the first real fiscal panic of the nation. And from this point forward, about every 20 years, there's another financial panic. The cause of the Panic of 1819 is a huge demand in American cotton. Cotton was able to be produced quicker, cheaper, and easier thanks to cotton gin, thanks to the land that's in the South. And there is a lot of land speculation, mostly created by the new National Bank, that says, yes, this land is going to be, you're going to make a lot of money on this land. You can farm tons of cotton on this land, and people start buying it up, not realizing that that's not the case. And money is loaned out for people to buy land. People cannot pay the money back, and then the bank defaults on the land. When this continues to happen, it really gets people angry that the National Bank is more interested in making money for itself than taking care of the pop 
the government eventually has to step in to help make getting land easier. And that takes a couple of decades for it to really figure out how to do that well. People were so upset about the second bank that the state of Maryland actually tried to sue the Baltimore branch, saying that the branch had not paid taxes. And the state sued James McCullough, who was the uh, branch manager. The Supreme Court ultimately dismissed the charges against him and says that states cannot tax the federal government. And in this one action, the Supreme Court transfers significantly more power to the federal government over state governments. James Monroe was the last of our Virginia dynasty, our founding father. He was at the Constitutional Convention. He will be the last person to have been both involved in the Revolutionary War and president. From this point forward, the Federalist Party is done. They, they do not have someone who is functionally can run. The guy that they put up for office was Rufus King. And he was just a figurehead. He was just another namespace on the ballot, essentially. When Monroe runs in 1820, there is virtually no one who can oppose him. There are people who try to, but they really don't uh, stand a chance. And he wins by such a tremendous landslide that he won all but one electoral vote in the Electoral College. The one who did not vote for Monroe said, I don't want to vote for you because if I do, you will be a unanimously elected president. And the only time that it happened before was George Washington. And Monroe was good, but Washington was, well, Washington. The period of 1816 to 1824, basically Monroe's presidency, was known as the era of good feelings because there's some strong nationalism, but there's also strong sectionalism the idea that different parts of the nation would could should be treated differently than others and the big sectional differences that we see are in the area of slave versus free states one of the best ways that we saw the federal government try to balance these sectional tensions is to make sure there's an equal number of slave and free states when missouri applies for uh, statehood, they apply as a slave state. This was seen as, whoa, no way, because Missouri was north of the Missouri, uh, was north, it was north of the Mason-Dixon line. And Northerners said, hey, we, this, this isn't right, but you know, we, have, we can't have more than one than the other. So Missouri, what if, in the Talmagate Amendment, what if Missouri is accepted into the Union as a slave state, but accepts gradual emancipation? And the South, the Southern slave states, they just, they lose their business on this one. The compromise comes in creating the Missouri Compromise Line, the 3060 parallel that says there will be no more slave states north of this line. And in return, Maine will become, will be a free state and maintain as a free state, especially since it's so far north. This balance is going to be um, the policy for the next three and a quarter decades until the Civil War. Northern Republicans are really worried that the expansion of slavery in the South actually gives the Southern states more presence in legislature, in the Electoral College, because slaves count for representation numbers in those institutions but slaves can't vote or hold office so 
if there's enough slaves in the southern states, then those states could effectively maintain legislative and electoral control indefinitely. When Latin America starts fighting for their wars of independence, and this begins in 1810 and stretches into the 1820s, this is seen as really good for American business because it opens trade in these areas. Spain was no longer the big powerhouse empire that it once was, and once these nations start fighting for freedom, there's really no way that Spain can maintain their hold on these colonies. England is also trading with Latin America and says that a declaration of control might be beneficial to both. Uh, we don't like this at all. And this is where the Monroe Doctrine will be passed. And yeah, it is passed under uh, President Monroe. It says that there's no more, from this point on, there's no more European colonization of the Americas. The, Ameri the United States will stay out of European wars, we will remain neutral unless we are pulled into it. All countries that are forged on this landmass will be business for this landmass, and Europe is no longer to get involved here. Ultimately means we're staying out of their business, so they should stay out of our business. And it kind of works because Number one, for the next couple of decades, Europe is going to be busy with a couple of internal wars, first with Napoleon, uh, then with Prussia, then with France and Prussia to go to war for a while. Italy is created, Germany is created. The, the, the Europeans are kind of busy, and it's a long way to come to the, the Americas. In 1824, the Democratic Republicans are the only quote unquote party but they're no longer a united party. We have in the election of 1824, four different Democratic Republicans who run for presidential office. And each one of these guys symbolized a regional or philosophical difference that was really out there. And to no surprise, with there being four different people, each one of them having such a broadly different background and idea, there is no consensus on who will become president. No one gets the plurality of votes. Well, Andrew Jackson gets the plurality of votes, but he doesn't get the majority to win. And the continental rules say that, uh, sorry, constitutional rules say that in, in a situation like this, the legislative body will pick from the top three candidates, which will be Jackson, Adams, and Crawford. But candidate number four is Henry Clay. He is also Speaker of the House. So he controls who is going to be voting, and he hates Jackson. So Clay, as head, as Speaker of the House, uses his influence to make sure that John Adams becomes president. And a few days after that, Adam announces, oh, Henry Clay, the guy who made me president, is now Secretary of State. And John Quincy Adams becomes president. This is how Adams becomes president. This cast doubt and a shadow on Adams for the rest of his presidency. And Jackson is so angry that he was cheated out of the presidency like this, and he really was, he got the plurality of the votes, that he is going to spend the next few years trying to take down John Adams and Henry Clay. This corrupt bargain will also lead to the breakup of the Democratic Republican Party. Now, even though John Quincy Adams came into power like this, he was greatly qualified to be president. He was John Adams' son, and John Adams was the second president of the United States. He was 
he was greatly educated as both a lawyer and a philosopher. He had been the ambassador to Prussia, ambassador to Russia, ambassador to the Netherlands, ambassador to England. He had been a senator. He had been secretary of state. And he had been involved in the political party from the time he understood what it was. He supervises the purchase of Florida from the Spanish. And he he's also really obnoxious. Um, he's very inflexible. He will, if it's his plan, then he is going to give it everything he's got. But if it's not his plan or if it's against his plan, he's going to stand against it also with everything he's got. John Quincy Adams wanted to create the active national state. The idea of this is that there's going to be new laws that are going to actively create a agricultural commerce, manufacture, and the arts. A new national university and an observatory will be built during this time. A naval academy, which will become Annapolis, will be built. We were going to get off the imperial system and we we're going to adopt the metric system. And you can see from this list that a couple of these things, yeah, that happened. Yeah, we had that. Okay, we didn't get that one. And the big one is going to be the metric system. Uh, some people saw Adams as being too elitist. Some people said he was spending too much money on these things. But the big thing is he just didn't work well with others. And that was one of the things that kept some of these programs from happening. In 1828, Andrew Jackson and his supporters who, you know, they were pissed that they had lost in 1824, they spent the next four years desperately trying to undermine everything Adams would could do. And Jackson puts Martin Van Bureau in charge of campaigning for him. And this is the first real political machine. What that means is he, Van Bureau created the cult of personality of and Andrew Jackson made sure people knew who Andrew Jackson was, what he stood for, what his goals were, what his impact was going to be. And this was relatively easy for Van Bureau because, well, Andrew Jackson, he was a war hero in the War of 1812, uh, saved New Orleans using pirates. And he had this nickname of Old Hickory. Now that just meant that was because he carried around an old hickory stick. And he was a part of a new political party. No longer the Democratic Republicans. These are the Democrats now. The party for the common man. And as elected president, he is a man full of contradictions. He is from the West. He's not from a major East Coast city. He even though he's from the West, he grows up very uh, elite. He grows up with a good background. Uh, he is orphaned from a young age. He had no college education. He joins the military. He gets rich, but he doesn't like rich people. He loves the idea of democracy, but not democracy for everyone. He likes the federal power because, you know, he has the power himself and he vetoes more than anyone else. Uh, he veto, he used a presidential veto power 12 different times, and 12 isn't a big number, but the first six presidents only used it 10 times, and it was his way or the highway. People nicknamed him King Andrew because of how inflexible he could be. And this is again coming off of what John Quincy Adams did. The Democrats supported the idea that the common man is involved in politics, whether it's a banker or merchant. They thought that government should be laissez-faire. The economy should 
not be controlled by the government. The economy should be controlled by the economy. And if you're successful, you'll be successful. And if you're not successful, then you're just going to fail. During Jackson's democracy, the Democrats are going to cut down the national debt in 1835. They lower tariffs. They remove the first national bank from existing and they refuse to fund any internal improvements. What this does is it, well, there's more money that's gonna be left over at the end of this. States had to replace the federal government as the force of where the economy is coming from. And so the focus of banking is now gonna be more state-based, less federal-based. Jackson liked states' rights. But as president, he still needed to uphold the federal policy. In 1828, uh, the tariff of 1828 is passed. Uh, it was very unpopular in the South. The Southerners said, this isn't fair. We shouldn't have to pay these extra tariffs, especially if we're making so much money for the nation with agricultural goods. South Carolina specifically said, we're not going to pay them and there's nothing the federal government can do about it. And this was a huge surprise to see a state so adamantly uh, be against what the federal government is doing. And there's actually some rumblings that, you know, the state was right in the executive branch. The vice president under Jackson said, you know, maybe we should let them not follow this law if it's not something they agree in. And as you can imagine with what we said about Jackson, Jackson definitely did not like that. Uh, and he didn't like the idea that more and more Southerners feel that it was okay to do this. The nullification crisis had really reached a boiling point when South Carolina said, if you don't let us nullify this law, then we're just going to leave the Union. We're going to step out of the United States. And Jackson says, you're not going anywhere. So he says, if you don't agree to sign this, if you don't agree to follow the tariff of 1828, then we're going to send in martial law. We're going to send in the army and act martial law. And, and that's just going to be the way it is. And ultimately, North Car uh, South Carolina agrees to this. The thing that Jackson is remembered for most is the actions against Native Americans. Many Americans wanted to keep expanding west where Native Americans are living. And this led to the Indian Removal Act, which forced Native Americans to move west of the Mississippi. Jackson did not like the Native Americans at all. And we see that the federal government, and in fact, most Americans were also kind of in the same camp. The Cherokee Nation versus Georgia was a time where Native Americans tried to sue the state of Georgia for uh, land disputes, and the court ruled that Native Americans could not sue a state because Georgia, well, because Native Americans were not citizens. Worcester versus Georgia was another court case where the court ruled that Native Americans could not be forced to move, but Jackson refused to enforce that. The attitude against Native Americans had really reached this decisive boiling point with the Trail of Tears. Jackson used federal troops to suppress and supervise the, the Cherokee. Ultimately, 18,000 Native Americans were going to be forced to leave their homes and go into the reservation territories west of the Mississippi, located in Missouri, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska. 4,000 people would die along the way, and other problems like this would continue to happen. Uh, Seminole tribes, Creek tribes, Choctaw tribes all saw the same type of treatments. 
1837, realizing that the land speculation issues from the last depression, the, uh, the Panic of 1819, really had never been fixed, Jackson required that all land purchases be made in either gold or silver. The problem is there's not enough of those metals around to justify this. And this led to a financial panic just as Jackson is leaving office. The speculation wasn't the only problem though. We see that there's crop failures in other territories and British banks are no longer loaning as much as they used to. And this led to a economic depression that lasted from 1837 to 1843. Prices fall, people are out of business, farms close. And when President Van Buren is elected, he comes in as kind of this like, well, he inherited the problem. And that was that was definitely rough. He believes that part of the economic depression's problem comes from federal funds being in private banks, no, not in a, a national banking system. So he decides to get rid of them, to break up the government banks, to create an independent treasury system where money can be deposited into large banks, but those banks couldn't use them for big loans. Now, this was a very dangerous idea because all your eggs are in one basket and that basket is now down a river and you just, well, I hope that gets to where it's going to go. It ends favorably because of the discovery of gold in California. And if that hadn't have happened when it did how it did, we probably would have seen the economic collapse of this nation. The action ultimately was condemned by the Whigs who repeal it and then replace him with Polk. Van Buren was the little magician. He was able to create the idea of the political machine, but he really wasn't able to follow Jackson well. And the fact that he inherited this ginormous problem is no surprise that he was only a one-term president. The Whigs go on to support another war hero, William Henry Harrison. It was pretty easy to blame everything bad that was happening on Van Buren. Uh, he was an elitist. He had taken a lot of what Jackson had done, and he was inherent to the program. And typically speaking, when you see something like, you know, inheriting a problem, you're blamed for the problem. The election of 1840, it popularly is uh, more of a split than you would think between Harrison and Van Buren. The thing about Harrison is, yes, he becomes president, but he dies in office. He dies after only a month in office. On his inauguration day, uh, it is cold, it is wet, and he decides to leave the carriage to walk in the streets and, you know, wave to the people and, hey, look, here I am. I'm going to be president. I am president. I'm going to be sworn in at Capitol Hill. And he gets, he catches his death while he's out there, uh, gets very sick. And after less than a month, he's dead. And the president who follows him is John Tyler. This was the first time that a person had become president because a president died. So Tyler serves almost the entire four-year term as president. And that's, that's another thing that doesn't happen. Usually when we get somebody a die in office and replace they're like in their last couple years or even last year in office not you have four full years ahead of you and Tyler was put on the ticket with Harrison because Tyler was from the south and it was thought that this would be a good balancing act between the two 
In practicality, Tyler starts vetoing all sorts of Whig legislation. He wants a new bank. He wants new tariffs. He spends money on internal improvements. And he can't get anything done. He is... He was the vice president picked to garner votes in the South, but he is not popular enough in the rest of the party to gain full support for what he wants to do. And that's going to be our wrap up for democracy in America in the early 19th century. We see there's infighting, there is hurt feelings, there is backstreet deals, and there is par political party ideologies that dominate what you're going to do. So, a lot of the stuff we're still seeing today, unfortunately. Hope you learned something new today. I'll see you next time.